And the issue of subsidy payments in Nigeria, particularly petroleum subsidy, has been a subject of debate over the years. Fuel subsidies became institutionalized in 1977 following the promulgation of the Price Control Act, which made it illegal for some products, including petrol, to be sold above the regulated price. This law was introduced by the General Lucia Guabasanjo regime in order to cushion the effects of the global great inflation era of the 1970s caused by the worldwide increase in energy prices. However, as it is now, Nigeria is spending so much paying for fuel subsidy, and this, many economic analysts say, is not good for Nigeria's economic development. Nigeria has also come under fire from the International Monetary Fund as well as World Bank for the heavy financial burden it carries in providing subsidies. Now, what are the key issues? Why is it difficult to let go of the subsidy payment? These questions and more will be answered by Dr. Kalu Idikakalu, a two-time Nigeria Minister of Finance. Good morning, Dr. Kalu Idikakalu. Good morning. Thank you for joining us on the program. Great to see you. Could you make it a bit louder, please? Good morning, Dr. Carlo. Just Thank saying good morning to you. Happy to see you. Okay, good morning. <laughs> All right. Now, various administrations have um, unsuccessfully tried to remove fuel subsidies since the transition to civilian rule in 1979. I mean, you served in the administration of General Ibrahim Babangida, who tried to do away with petrol subsidy <coughs> following the implementation of the Structural Adjustment Program. There was a huge uproar against the decision, and this trend has continued till now. Tell me, what are the key issues? Why can't we do away with petrol subsidy? Well, the first question is uh, petroleum subsidies are not things to just scoop out in one fell swoop. Uh, subsidies arise from um, the differentials between domestic price in Naira and the external price in foreign exchange, supposed to be roughly very much. So once, because of the management of the economy, the management of the exchange rate, uh, the policies that we are implementing under various programs, put pressure on the Naira. And the Naira, once that depreciation is significant, you know, business people can always see a leeway whereby they now begin to see how they can make more profit by carrying that good, which is, as it were, held low in Naira terms across the border, whether it's northern, western, or eastern border, what have you, or even in the, in the port areas in the south. So it is not the way we discuss it as if it's just something that uh, somebody can just go and scoop out. If you remove subsidy, you have to make sure that there will be other policy measures that you have to implement to sustain a stable price system, a stable price system between domestic prices and the border price, as we say, or the foreign exchange price. So if you remove it and you don't do anything, of course, the subsidy will come again. Now, having said that, uh, I had written the paper about this thing, which constituted uh, essentially the structural adjustment program. It is in the line with the regulation of the economy where you are letting the prices more or less determine uh, the, the equilibrating level for both supply and demand that everybody knows. But if you do not follow through in so many areas, then you can see why this problem has persisted over time. So it's not just a matter of having the, the, uh, the will or the bravery or bravado to, to remove subsidies. You have to address all the macroeconomic policies that also affect the price in the general system of things. So that is why it has lingered for so long. Now, I mean, in all that you have said, it's no brainer. Nigeria is an entire economic street. And now yes. you talked about the issue of the foreign exchange. This fuel subsidy didn't just start now. 
And even though a lot of people have been talking about all oh, the Naira being devalued and the foreign exchange and all of that, and that is being blamed on what is, you know, happening. Is that really where we got it wrong? Where did we start to go wrong? Yes, that is a, a very good question. Uh, the few minutes that I can speak to this will really be quite inadequate to get to all the issues. But when we talk about a structural adjustment system, in Korea, where the program was first implemented, and I was a very much part of that program, uh, or in any other country. It is not a system that you implement in one budget or in one plan. Structural adjustment is a continuous process, particularly in a developing country, where the changes in the aggregates, the sub-aggregates of demand and supply, are changing in large measure, because you are going through structural change. You are developing agriculture, you are developing non-agriculture, you are getting the gas and the oil, you are going into the uh, services industry, the entertainment industry, as you know. A few years ago, all of these were revalued, and that put Nigeria ahead as number one economy in Africa. So, literally, these quantums continue to change. But the way you manage your exchange rate, your interest rates, your money supply, your tariffs, your taxes, the income structure, the allocation of resources, all of these things impinge on the general price level. And those have to be guided, not entirely by the uh, vagaries in the price system, but more or less, as you can see, even in our local markets, when prices are, are going high, it's easy to see why, because supply is falling short. We are far from the harvest time. Or we are, and then when they begin to fall, you know we are getting close to the harvest time or there's a relative abundance. It is the same principle. It is not from uh, the IMF or the World Bank or ADB or anybody else. So the way you keep the system in balance, as it were, like in every other sphere, is to maintain that balance. You let the, the pressure of supply and demand, more or less reflect the price. Of course, every government, right down to the most advanced, the US, the Germany, UK, they, they watch these systems, but the changes they make, and that's the mistake we make, we think that they are all implementing what we are doing, the changes they make. Well, Dr. Kalu, well, listening to the NNPC GMD, it is now imminent that um, removal of subsidies is inevitable. It is also believed that subsidies are approximately at 3 trillion naira a year. That's almost 20% of the budget and, of course, 50% of the fiscal uh, deficit. Therefore, what do you think are the implications of removal of subsidy or macroeconomic um, stability? Well, um, the first thing I should say is that I'm not very comfortable with the way the, the government statement is coming across. You see, this question of determine, you see, when you determine to remove subsidies of that amount, of that magnitude, you have to think, as you just said, what, it will, what impact it will have on the general price level, and, uh, and that affects the savings, investment, procurement of so many other things, income levels, and so on and so forth. When it gets to this level, what should uh, pro be properly advised is that there will be a phasing, yes, provided you stick to that phasing. You may decide to remove 25% uh, and maybe 50%. Really not a good day when it comes to <laughs> uh, technology and um, internet. Well, anyway, in okay. To, to explain that impact, if you are removing 100%, which I oppose when it was being tried uh, during uh, the last decision of uh, Jonathan administration, the issue was not to remove or not to remove. But since you waited so long to do it, you face it in order not to, as it were, upset the economic Africa. You have to do it in a smooth way so that the injury is not so much. And some of the things you have to do, you think of the elasticity of demand for all the products where these things come to go. Will people adjust? Are you providing transportation? Are you providing housing uh, benefits or something of the sort? So you have to look at the whole range of things that will be affected 
drastically by the uh, one fair suit removal, or even when you take it into two stages, take it into two parts. So this is what I want to hear the government to say. We are going to do this, and this is how we are going to cushion the impact of this removal. It is not the bravery of Bravado of doing it in one person that is impressive. It is not put into uh, place the, the policies to ameliorate the overall impact, and secondly, come out with specific macro and micro policies that will make sure that these policies and these subsidies don't begin to come up again. That is the issue of making sure that, that all these things that affect the parity between domestic and petroleum prices. Of course, we you know this all goes to talk about the, the sources of supply, uh, refineries, the importation, the cost of importation, the, uh, all the issues pertaining to importation, tariffs, storage, and so on and so forth, as well as accessibility to your other sources. These are all the major micro macro policies that have to be in place before you just say you are so determined to remove it. Uh, that is not what should be impressive. What should be impressive is the overall macro policy that will cushion the impact and also prevent the real emergence of instruction. All right, Dr. Carlo, talking about overall macro policy that will cushion the effect, at least, uh, I mean, the government uh, believes that the people that probably might be most uh, affected, uh, are the people they describe as the most vulnerable, and they are offering 5,000 Naira to these people for a period of time. I mean, is that also a way to go? Uh, that is too factory and casual. As I said, uh, in many cases, from I will not have been there over and over, you, you don't get a unitary direction in terms of policy impact. There are several people that will be involved, and uh, it is not just people who are also in the government who you can deliver this to perhaps because it should go outside the public sector. But nonetheless, uh, as I said, given the real value of 5,000 Naira, especially because of the, uh, the depreciation of the exchange rate over time, that may not be enough. You may want to do something in quantum that has the economies of scale, uh, reduction of, uh, of uh, you know, suspension of housing. In America, they've done that. They, they do quality to make sure there are people out there who've not been living pensions for what I hear for unbelievable length of period like two years or three years. Giving them 5,000 is not going to have made a much. And I'm just giving one example. So, yes, I suppose that will go some, some way. But government has to, has to be a, a multidisciplinary approach. Finance and transport and housing and health, all of them should be involved to come out with a broad range of policies. And you price those policies. If it's like the equivalent of $10 and you cannot afford it, you, you go down in another equivalent to what you can afford, but make sure that the impact spreads through the entire system. But mm. just giving a cash to, uh, of that uh, uh, Apart from the fact that that cash in the start put pressure on, so on, on short-term supply. And if you said it, also... Uh, involve the inflation also kicking up again. So what I, I suggest, without getting all the details from the government policy, I think it should come across to us as something that is fully thought through to affect the impact on income, to affect the impact, impact on production and distribution, and so on and so forth. And secondly, in terms of the elasticity of demand for square, that something has to be addressed to the areas that people will divert to. If the poor become, become that more expensive because, because it's the import of uh, giving subsidies. What, what alternatives do people have? Are you subsidizing public transportation? Are we providing trade services at lower prices, maybe? And so on and so forth. You know, these are the immediate impacts in the transport sector. Mm. You know? So this is what I'm saying. So 5,000, well, that will go somewhere, but it's better we have a more robust uh, across the board approach. All right. Uh, the totality of that may come up to 5,000. It, it may come out to more, and then the government has to decide just if it can do a little bit more than just a numeric uh, 5,000 naira. Uh, so, right. I don't know. Are you saying this over two budget years or just in one budget year? I don't know. <laughs>
<laughs> well, it's just for six months, according to the finance minister. Anyway, are there lessons to actually be learned from other African countries who pay more for petrol, and yet their inflation rate is low because the agitation over this uh, removal of subsidy is uh, perhaps um, the inflation that that would also uh, aggravate? Yes, well, it is not just uh, African countries. You will go to Middle East countries, go to Latin America. Some of them get, of course, much more violent than we get when we protect this thing. But as you say, the lesson to be learned is that there are countries that are paying a lot more. But you see, uh, they are paying a lot more, and if you investigate, the incomes may be more better distributed. The incomes are more regularly paid. There are other services. As I just said, in terms of alternatives, alternatives to buy the highest price of wealth at the new price, they have other alternatives. So that is the secret. In other words, they have, they have to be uh, attention to efficient macro policy management in place. So that when these things arise, the cushioning is less severe. The dislocation of the system is not as uh, significant as what you get when you just uh, do all these other suboptimal policies in so many sectors. So the reasons why they are different, as I said, is that maybe the, the real incomes are higher, they are paid more regularly, there are other services, they have other, uh, what we call safety net in terms of uh, health, housing, and so on, and the fees are managed in schools, primary and secondary, and so on and so forth. There could be a whole lot of other things that actually cushion the impact of social justice so that they don't get the type of, of uh, the type of uproar we get to the Nigerian case where this becomes a major issue with the labor unions, with the various unions, uh, in the campus, uh, staff unions, and so on and so forth. So we have to look at the broad range of all the macro policies, and this has to feature in the situation of the budget or the plan. That is why the as I said, the whole essence of dynamic management, dynamic balancing of all these factors. It has to be a continuous process. Social adjustment is not a one-off a one -off kind of thing. You are restructuring the economy as the economy is gearing off from one sector to another sector. We are trying to diversify. As you diversify out of uh, the basic food into uh, technology and uh, high-tech areas or entertainment areas, as you grow the social institutions, these things are taking a, a differential in the way resources are allocated. So they are, they are, that is a continuous structural reform of the economy, right. or whatever name we call it. You know, way in the past we are debating this, one step explaining that. If you forget about what it is called, it is just reforming the economy in areas that become necessary as changes in demand and supply occur. It's not a fast structural adjustment at this in time, what will this happen during the time of that? This okay. goes to show that at times we don't quite yet understand it. It's a continuous wow. process. So if we, if, we, if we involve policies in a continuous way, these changes will be minimal, and there won't be so much offer or so much need to flex mm. muscles or bravado or say government uh, has the, uh, the will. That doesn't require much will. This is social economics. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carlo Udika. Hello, that's quite um, interesting there, even Thank though you. our technology didn't permit us to see you very well and hear you very well. But, I mean, we got the message. Thank you, Dr. Kalu, Idika Kalu, the former finance minister of Nigeria.